Hi everybody, this is Dr. Lisa Love and this is a special presentation that I've actually been spending many months working on, but I felt that it was time to accelerate getting these videos done. This is Revelation, an Esoteric Look. And this is the first video, part one. So what is Revelation by St. John? Well, it is a book in the Christian Bible that is thought by traditionally exoterically minded Christians to predict the end times. And there's a lot of talk about that going on here when this video is done in January 2021, though I started these videos in 2020, middle of 2020 actually. So I thought it was becoming even more important for me to get an understanding of this book out there more clearly. And the book is divided into 22 chapters. And throughout thousands of years, people have been looking for an end times to come. And some people are actually eagerly anticipating that as the world may accelerate into worldwide violence, that this is a good thing, that somehow or another, this is a sign of the end times. And this video is meant to challenge that perception. Because could it be that the end times are always here? And might the themes in Revelation repeat themselves over and over again until we get the real point of what this book is all about? Well, this video series makes that case showing how Revelation is a symbolic teaching that is easily deciphered. And I'm gonna use that word again, easily deciphered. It's not some complicated thing we gotta really wrap our heads around if you understand its esoteric meaning of revealing the war between material 666, where the circle is at the bottom, and spiritual values 999, where the circle of spirit is at the top, and how the war between these material and spiritual values apply to our everyday lives. So what is the exoteric approach? So I'm gonna to begin to focus on that. And I have a picture here of somebody who is very much involved in the exoteric or outer world, the world of the five senses. You wake up every day and you think that this world that you see with your five senses is the most important thing there is because you're not able to really discern and see spiritual realities. And so the idea is to have dominion over the earth or domination over the earth. And the tendency, even if you are in a religious point of view, is to think that the righteous, the ones on the quote right side, will win and they will be given dominion over the earth. But that feeds the idea of selfishness and separation. And it actually, in that world, creates a world of separation where we have people who are better than the others, whether it's he versus she, one race versus another, one worldview versus another. What it essentially does is it destroys and divides and prevents the ability to unify us as one humanity on one world. And it falsely believes in a material reward system. That is the 666. Because again, the circle of the six is at the bottom. Materialism is what is winning here. And even if you believe in some heaven elsewhere, it's still this idea of a material kind of heaven. And as I already said, it can glorify the destruction of the earth in the belief that there is one people, race, sex, worldview that should dominate over the other. And that is eating of the tree of good and evil. Evil is live spelled backwards. The devil is lived spelled backwards. It is anti-creating a harmonious, peaceful life on this earth with diversity that creates the unity. Instead, it's trying to create conformity and uniformity, one form, one worldview, one sex, one race gets to dominate and get all the spoils. That is 
the tree of good and evil. That's what that is. But the esoteric approach, which is going to become really, really obvious that Revelations is about an esoteric approach as we go through these videos and this symbolism, is a focus on the inner world beyond what the five senses reveal. And that can only be done with certain spiritual practice practices, especially involving yoga. And I'm not talking Hatha yoga, that can be a part of it, but that's, that's not it. It's the inner yoga that is achieved primarily through practices of meditation. And here the idea is to have dominion over yourself, to discover inwardly your negative tendencies, your, your own inner separation. What is it in us that makes us want to believe that one race is better than another? What is it in us that makes us want to dominate one sex over the other? What is it in us that can't see clearly? Our own negative tendencies, our own negative conditioning, thoughts and beliefs, and how we need to overcome them. That's what Revelation is clearly all about. It feeds the capacity to create unity compassion and love and it creates a world of peace that is the new jerusalem a world of peace where all people's views all races both sexes are harmonized together so that our earth is purified it becomes quote the celestial virgin something that is virgin is pure it is clean it's wholesome it's healthy it's good for us it is cherished, including women are cherished, and it is respected. Our Mother Earth is respected. That is the point of Revelation, which I will very, very, very clearly reveal to you. And that's why we eat of the Tree of Life, which is when the energies go up the central spine and help us maintain balance, maintain a, a ability, a capacity to unify and heal versus divide. So here are the 22 chapters in my summary of the 22 chapters. I'm not going to read them all here at the moment, but I am going to look at the first four that we're going to talk about in this first video. So it starts basically with St. John on Palmos seeing a vision. And he talks to the churches in general in chapters two and three. And uh, here's some of the more churches. There are seven churches that he talks to. And then uh, he also has a vision of God's throne. So that's what this particular video is going to focus on. What are these elements really about? Not literally, symbolically. And here is a short summary of the video. Exoterically, it's seen as John goes into a mystical state, enters a throne room and has a vision, including seven lampstands with seven stars above them. There's more to it than that, which we're gonna see in this video, but that's the gist of it. Esoterically, St. John goes into Samadhi, which is the highest states you achieve in meditation, and is asked by the divine who will be able to open the seven chakras so that we can enter Samadhi, the throne room, along with him. Let's get into more depth. Starting with chapter one. John hears a voice and sees a vision. And I want you to notice this little symbol over here. I'm the Alpha and Omega, Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Well, Revelations begins, here's the esoteric, or the exoteric version, with St. John hearing a voice that sounds like a trumpet coming from the Alpha and Omega. That's how St. John describes God. It's neither male nor female. It's like he writes about in the Gospel of John, I might repeat this later, where it's a word. It's something abstract. God is abstract. The Alpha, Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So St. John hears a voice that sounds like a trumpet coming from this Alpha and Omega. And the voice asked John to, quote, write what you see to the seven churches, which are symbolized as seven lampstands. Now, already, 
you can tell something's going on here. Why are seven churches seven lampstands? Why are we already going into symbolic teaching? Because that's what esoterically minded training gives you the ability. It builds your mind and your capacity to read things, not literally, but symbolically. So already we're getting a big hint straight out. This is a symbolic teaching. Now in the middle of the seven lampstands, St. John sees a man with white hair whose voice sounds like many waters. The man is holding seven stars in his right hand, which are said to represent the angels of the seven churches. And out of the man's mouth comes a two-edged sword, and his face, we are told, shines like a sun with full strength. And St. John is told to write to the seven churches overseas on behalf of the seven angels, telling the churches that unless they do right, they will not be able to eat from the tree of life. So, so far, this sounds like a kind of like a bizarre acid trip that somebody is on. And that's why so many people who are literally minded are really struggling to understand what is this about? Well, I'm going to reveal it to you. Let's start with who is God. So again, St. John has a revelation coming from the Alpha and Omega that has a voice sounding like a trumpet. And as I said already, this is not a man with white hair that looks like a human being. This is an energy that is everything that is. Now, exoterically, you could see this as God, but St. John speaks about God in a non, that should have said, human and metaphysical way. God, quote, is a voice that sounds like a trumpet. That God is a voice is no surprise because in the Gospel of John in the Christian Bible, St. John, the Gospel of John's book begins by saying he believes God is the Word. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was God. And what is the Word? Where those of us that are involved in meditation and yoga practices know that that Word is the Om, also known as the A-U-M or the Amen. Now those are very ancient words because there were religions that predated Christianity that Christianity heavily borrowed from, if you understand esoteric views of the different world religions. And the Amen is a derivative of the A-U-M or the O-M, which is found in the East. Now this should be no surprise. After all, we're told in the Bible that Jesus went down to Egypt and spent most of his life there. Now, some people want to say he went over to India and all kinds of other places, but we often act like the world religions at that time weren't intermixing. They were heavily. They were mixing primarily in Egypt, where Alexander the Great established the Great Library of Alexandria. So this training and this intermixing of the different religions was going on extensively back then. And no surprise that the world's oldest religion, Hinduism, with its offshoot of Buddhism, and we have other religions that were at that time, and if you get into esoteric traditions, you'll find that. But no surprise that in those really ancient religions, they talked about the Om or the AUM, which then became the Amen. This is the word of God, not the Christian Bible. The Om, the AUM, or the Amen. And for those familiar with the sciences of yoga and meditation, it is known that that word in meditation can be factually heard, not made up, not a hallucination of your mind. You learn to hear it, not just because you're chanting it, you learn to hear it. And training is also given in how to sound the sacred word in such a way it stimulates the entire brain, awakening the brain into spiritual receptivity. God is also not just a word, but God is the alpha, the beginning, and omega, the end. Essentially, St. John is telling us right away that God is everything that is, stretching out into infinity. God is not just male or female. God is both. God is not just a human. God is everything. Stars, galaxies, planets. God is in everything and God is everything and God is in all races and all human beings and all animals and all plants and all minerals and every single solitary thing that is. 
is God, which is a fundamental esoteric understanding. So who is this man? Well, first of all, some exoteric teachings associate this man with Jesus. And we're going to go into that a lot more in these particular videos because there is a partial truth to that, but not a total truth to that. Well, one of the reasons it doesn't follow that this particular man is Jesus is Jesus is later bought into the story as a lamb. So that means that this particular man in Revelations is not Jesus. This is somebody else. So let's look at the symbolism. First, we see that this man has white hair, implying he is of a great age, and his voice is like many waters. And for me, that indicates that he can stream forth in different kinds of thought streams in many different kinds of ways. Thought waves stream out. His face shines like a sun, which may mean that St. John is saying he doesn't have an actual face, that his face actually is the sun. And the implication is that the man is more celestial than human. I also believe this man is meant to represent a state of consciousness, Christ consciousness to be exact, and it may actually be expanded beyond Christ consciousness. I'm willing to have that debate, but it's at least at the Christ consciousness level. In front of the man are seven lampstands, and he holds seven stars in his right hand, which we're going to look at in the next slide, and actually in a lot of these videos, what these lampstands really are and these seven stars really are. And out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword. Well, first off, that's kind of a, a strange thing to say. Why not just say out of his mouth comes a sword? Why say a two-edged sword? I mean, all swords have two edges. It can't be a sword if it doesn't have two edges. Have you ever seen a one-edged sword? So why emphasize the two-edged sword here? That's because it is symbolic. And in esoteric circles, it is known that a sword stands for truth. And the ability to discern truth from lies, or the real, who we really are as spiritual beings, from the unreal. And that's a major emphasis of revelation and something that we are better able to do to discern when our consciousness is shifted onto spiritual planes where Christ consciousness is said to be found. We're not going to get there if we're involved in the world of the five senses where our thoughts every day are consumed with what? Images of violence? Images of one race is better than another? Images of a male is better than a female? Or female is better than a male? That thought ideas have to compete and they can't be bridged and understood and unified or appreciated for the diversity they bring us? Most of us spend our lives thinking about what we're going to eat, how we're going to entertain ourselves, what we're going to see, what we're going to hear, what we're going to smell, what we're going to taste, what we're going to touch throughout our every day, preoccupied primarily with emotional states of anger or fear or anxiety or lust or those kinds of things. Examine your own thoughts. Actually, this whole series is going to be a real deep examination because that's what St. John wants us to do. Go inwardly and look at what's going on. So here are the seven lampstands. Having been introduced to God, what are the seven lampstands? At first, we read that they are seven gates. Well, that's kind of a funny thing. And when these gates are open, the seven lamps are lit with seven stars that have seven angels associated with them. Well, all of that sounds really bizarre, unless, you know, esoteric teachings, and then it just is obvious as heck. I mean, this is the chakra symbolism. First of all, here's your seven gates right there. It's when the lotuses, St. John refers to them as stars, but you could refer to them as roses, which you see in mystic Christianity, or lotuses, which you see more in Eastern traditions. But when they are in, in the state before they have opened, before they begin to bloom, they are sealed. And you have to break the seals and go through the gates in order to do what? 
Well, the gates of the doorways to the chakras, which are thought to be wheels of energy that exist in the human body. Now, the new age stuff has made this a lot more popular and we're getting a lot more understanding of chakras. So to be quite honest, a lot of it is very superficial still because there's a lot more depth of understanding than is out there in most books. So I will put in a plug here. My favorite person so far along these lines is Anodita. Anodia Judith, who I got to interview once in a radio program a long time ago. But another person that I really appreciate is Harish Johari. And actually, there are other teachings that go deeper than that. So what are the stars? Well, they are basically what we see. The man in Revelation has seven stars in his hand that he holds above the lampstands. They reveal that the chakras are lit and are now radiating their energy. You've broken the seals, you've gone through the gates, you're activating the chakras and they are lighting up. And as they light up, they look star-like. Don't they? Don't they look kind of like stars to you? They do to me. It's pretty obvious to me. These stars are also known as yantras. They're the symbols of the chakras, the seven chakras. And when they're fully opened, this is what we're told they look like. Now, we're going to get into this in a lot more detail through Revelation, and I'll be documenting like heck how St. John is referring to these in Revelation. But I want to show you that as these chakras are activated, so are the different glands within the human body. And that is one of the things that we'll learn a little bit a little bit about as well here. And I'm not going to get a lot into the glands because there's so much else to focus on. But I do want to emphasize something interesting, the pineal gland, which has to do with going up into the throne room or the crown chakra, is known by modern science to be hallucinogenic and photoreceptive. It produces light and visions. Now, that's also interesting. I've done this in other videos I produced because in the Vatican, there's a big statue of a pine cone. Well, that's kind of a bizarre thing. Why are we worshiping pine cones? What's what this kind of a strange religion is this? And yet the pine cone has to do with the opening of the pineal gland here. So we are surrounded by esoteric symbolism all over the place. And there's a lot of fear and baloney coming out about this kind of esoteric symbolism by people that don't know how to read symbolically because their minds aren't alert and awake enough yet. But it's time for us to get this kind of teaching out to more and more people. So they're not afraid of this symbolism. Instead, they learn how to understand what it's about. So who are the angels and who are these churches? Well, as those who follow the chakra system know, this is standard fare of the chakra system, each chakra has certain devas, deities, angels, and sounds, and colors even associated with them. That's part of the entire training of learning to become aware of what's going on with the energy streams in your body, how that affects the glands, how that affects your consciousness, how that keeps you either locked into the world of the five senses, where your life is pretty much about money, security, sex, pleasure, and power in your thoughts all day long, keeps you locked in what's known as the lower three senses of uh, what's known as the solar plexus chakra, the sacral chakra, and the root chakra. Let me get my little pointer out here. I think I'm going to need it, which are these right here. Most people's consciousness is actually locked into these down here. Their gonads and their ovaries, their sex life, their desire life, their pleasure life, money and security. Just go to any street on most of our cities and just look at what you see all around you. It's about eating. It's about restaurants. It's about banks. It's about money. It's about sex. It's about Victoria's Secret's clothing. It's about how to get lucky. I mean, turn on your television, listen to most of the songs on the radio. It's easy to see how most of humanity is locked here and actually striving for this one, which is all about power. Why? Because if you have these three activated, the six, six, and six, material emphasis, material emphasis, material emphasis, six, six, and six, then 
you get to have power and dominion over the earth and everybody else around you and you get to kind of be the bully and make everybody else the slaves and and your own idea of what is true wins and you don't have to stretch your mind and expand your consciousness and open your heart to embrace many other people you just get to have your way based on your very limited understanding of life but when you appeal to the angels and there are different angels associated with the different chakras in both eastern traditions and western traditions of spirituality and you sound the right sounds. There are different sounds that are associated with these different chakras as well that some of you already know. I'm not going li- to put all that in here. Then you break the seals and you open the gates. You activate them and you activate the associated glands in the body for better or worse. And here's the point about the story of Revelation. Depending on how purified the chakras were before they were opened. That is a major theme of the story of Revelation. If we haven't done the purification work, then when the timing is here, and there are always cycles, and the timing comes, whether we're ready for it or not, if we haven't done the necessary purificatory work, I can talk, then we suffer the consequences, and that's what revelation is really all about that's what saint john is warning us now though there are many attempts to connect different archangels in the christian tradition to the various chakras i've not done so i was going to but the reason i haven't is my research discovered that there is no clear agreement in the judeo-christian churches as to who the archangels even are I found seven, I found 12, I found people saying that these were the seven main ones. No, these are the seven main ones. And I found different articles that said, these are the seven ones that are associated with the chakras. No, these are the seven ones, same seven ones, but associated with different chakras. No, these are the seven ones, not even the same seven ones. I just went, forget it. That's too much of a debate. I don't want to get into who the angels might be. In Eastern tradition, it's really very clear which devas they call angels in the east are associated with different chakras but in the western judeo-christian tradition it was not so easy to figure out so even though i could propose a different archangel associated with different chakras i decided that i wasn't going to do that because there's no real solid consensus about that as there is in the eastern traditions But I do want to discuss the chakras and their possible association with the seven churches. Why? Because that's the first part of Revelation. John is told to write to the seven churches. Now, it is said that there are actually seven churches at that time. But then in chapters two and three, he goes through a lot of explanation trying to uh, talk about these seven churches. And we'll get into that in a bit. But for right now, I have to also mention that when we do the things that St. John tells us to do in Revelation, we will enjoy the tree of life. Well, what is the tree of life? Well, here's one artist's depiction of the tree of life. Notice something? See the seven stars lit in that tree? So before we jump to the specifics of the churches, I want to focus on how St. John says, if the churches do right, they will eat of the tree of life. And I'm repeating myself, but what is the tree of life? To begin with, in the Jewish esoteric tradition, it's the Kabbalah. Here's their tree. This has 10 different centers of force instead of seven, but we'll see in a moment how they connect. There you go. Here's the seven connecting with the 10 of the Kabbalah. And here is a Christian idea. Here are actually eight different uh, apostles, actually, here, associated with Jesus on the tree, enjoying the tree of life. That's an ancient illustration of the tree. The tree can also be represented as this, the nervous system of the body. And in fact, it has a lot to do with the nervous system of the body. We have a central nervous system which is known as the Shishuna. And we have a parasympathetic and a sympathetic nervous system, which are known as the Ida and the Pingala. And we're going to see that they are 
explained in some detail here in Revelation. So we not only get the central tree, the tree of life, we get its two trees next to it, known as olive trees in Revelation, which are also involved in the story as well. But that's going to be a later video when we bring in the two trees next to the central tree of life. The angels can represent the heads of the seven churches, or they can represent seven planets, because back then, for thousands of years, there were only thought to be seven planets in our solar system. And sometimes they were considered to be angels. But when we eat of the tree of good and evil, we are involved, as I've already shown, in duality and sin. Evil is lived spelled backwards. It's anti-life because we want to separate from each other and the world around us. We don't want to learn how to develop our God-given capacities or our alpha and omega capacities, which is both God and goddess. By the way, we don't want to learn to develop our minds and intuitive capacities so that we can tap into the unity of all living beings and live our lives in order to demonstrate that unity outwardly. We just don't want to bother with that. We'd rather entertain ourselves with endless amounts of meaningless Netflix. So now we're into chapters two and three, where St. John starts to speak to the seven churches. And I debated about whether to include this in the video because it's a little wordy here, but I'm, I'm going to. This is from the chapters two and three. So here is one of the first churches, Pergamum, which is interesting because that's kind of like purgatory isn't it? It's the lower level of the base of the spine. When we're in the densest, most limited state of consciousness, our basic need for security and survival in life can be hell because of living there. Now, St. John basically says to this church, you've held on to your faith, and if you conquer, he will come with a sword in his mouth. What is that sword again? That's the ability to discern. He will bring manna, that's like prana, and a white stone with a new name on it. Again, kind of strange language to say to a church, but basically it has to do, which we will see, with certain ideas that are associated with this chakra. And their negative traits are they hold on to the teachings of Balaam, who taught eating food sacrificed to idols and immorality. And that's interesting because we're involved with food primarily here. So that is very classically associated with the base of the spine, which is basic survival needs. Food, clothing, shelter. And when the consciousness is only focused there, it's like being in a purgatory. Thyatia. Their positive traits are love, faith, service, endurance, good works. And he tells them, do well and you will have power over all nations. Rule them with a rod of iron and be given a morning star. Morning star, by the way, is Venus, is the planet that was known as the morning star. So again, we're getting a symbolic language here. And their negative traits is they tolerated Jezebel and who taught that eating food sacrificed to idols was okay and taught them immorality, which was basically having sexual relations that weren't really sanctified. And the churches of Jezebel will be struck dead. Well, and again, I don't have time to get into all the details of the symbolism of the seven churches here, way too long of a video, but this is basically having to do with the sacral center, which has to do with sexuality and the right relations between men and women, and how to build respectful, loving relationships between men and women, and how to do that with any kind of sexual act that we're involved in. Then we have the dosia, which is interesting because that's a word that has to do with lackadaisical. And lackadaisical basically means getting kind of lazy here, which will fit in with a negative trait. They don't have any positive traits, they only have negative traits. They basically are lazy. They're too lukewarm and neutral. And he says they need to be more zealous and repentant. Well, that fits perfectly with the solar plexus center, which has to do with getting fired up, thrilled by the element of fire, and, and learning how to be, 
have more will, more purpose, more power in your quest. And they don't have it because they're too lazy, basically. Then we have Ephesus. Their positive traits is that they toil, they're patient, they endure, and they can't bear evil men, and they call out false apostles. So they have the ability to basically say, you know, who isn't following the right kinds of principles. But there's a real negative trait. They do it in a way that doesn't have any love. That makes them very hypocritical. That makes them want to tell everybody else how bad they are without learning how to love, respect, or appreciate them. That's very much an association with the heart chakra. The heart chakra is all about love, understanding, unity, and compassion. And when we're engaging love, which is something that Jesus in the Christian Bible emphasizes a great deal, and if you have not love, well, actually, that was St. Paul in Corinthians that did that one. But the whole teaching of love is something that the Church of Ephesus isn't doing. So they may say, you're bad, and you're not doing things the right way, but they're doing it in such a way that is more like the Pharisees that Jesus criticized, that were self-righteous and hypocritical. And St. John's calling them out. Philadelphia. Now they keep their word and did not deny his name, St. John says. And they don't have any negative traits. Well, that's interesting to me, word. Speech. Any of us that know about the chakras know that the throat center up here is associated with speech, with deceit and lies or telling the truth. When it's closed, when it's sealed, when we haven't gone through the gate correctly, we spew out all kinds of deceit and lies and get other people to believe it because they're, they're too stuck in their lower chakras to know how to discern. They don't have that sword coming out of their mouth all the way down here, you know, they don't even have that. So they can't discern truth from lies. And there are plenty of people willing to spread all kinds of lies for the purpose of what? For the purpose of conquering. Who's going to conquer? My group, my people, my right way, my white people, my black people, my Asian people, my belief system, my Christian belief system, my Muslim belief system, my, 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 my selfish, separative, my Jewish tradition, whatever it is. My separative tradition will rule. That is a sign that this throat center is toxic and has to be purified. And St. John's going to address that. Sardis has no positive traits listed. And negatively, their works just aren't very good. They've soiled their garments. They're no longer white. He's pretty much judging them. And that has to do with the third eye in that they basically have lost their way. They can't see, we're gonna talk more about this, uh, where there's no vision, the people perish type of thing. And then we have Smyrna. Now they are able to bear poverty and slander and are willing to be thrown in prison and are faithful unto death to get the crown of life. They don't have any negative traits. Well, that's the crown chakra. I mean, it's actually listed. So the seven churches may actually be seven real churches at the time that are having difficulty as St. John's calling them out, but they also match quite curiously the problems of the different seven chakras. And if these seven chakras aren't cleaned up, there's gonna be real problems, which we see in Revelation as the story continues. But remember, St. John had a vision of entering the throne room, which is in heaven. There someone is seated on a throne with a rainbow that looks like an emerald surrounding him. And around this person sits 24 elders dressed in white garments with gold crowns. And around the throne are four creatures, an ox, a lion, an eagle, and a man. And before the throne are seven burning torches, now said to be the seven spirits of God. And in front of the throne is a sea of glass that looks like crystal. And above the throne room, lightning and thunder can be seen and heard. So this is what the throne room is. It can sound kind of strange from an exoteric point of view. Let's look at it symbolically. First of all, what is this mysterious rainbow? 
I mean, what's interesting here is that even though St. John calls this a rainbow, it only has one color, green. That can come, sound kind of strange and bizarre unless you know esoteric symbolism. Because typically a rainbow is made up of seven colors. Now seven is interesting and it's named a lot of times in Revelation. It can include seven days of the week, seven major notes on the musical scale, the seven chakras which we're looking at, and something known as seven rays. Now regarding the seven rays, it is known in esoteric traditions that our earth of these seven rays is said to be on the third ray whose color is green. Now, this color hints at something else as we go back to the identity of the man who St. John is seeing, who is also said in this book to look like Jasper, a green stone. He also has some carnelian red. So who is this man? Well, in esoteric understanding, this man is the Lord of the world. He is the being that represents our planet Earth. And he's called in a variety of names by different religious traditions. Sunat Kamara, this is part of the ancient Hindu tradition, which is thousands of years old, even older than the Judeo tradition. And they always spoke about the Kumaras. In fact, when you get into studying the mythology of Hinduism, mythology, you see the correlations, including the whole Noah's Ark thing is similar to their story of a Manu. I mean, it's just really kind of bizarre the more I've gotten into understanding the ancient stories, how much you start to see Christianity has adapted them and the Judeo tradition has adopted them. Kind of interesting. I encourage you to expand and get into your understanding of various religions and maybe your heart will grow and you'll be a little bit more tolerant as you see how much these teachings have intersected with each other. Another name more from the Jewish tradition is Melchizedek or the Ancient of Days. Now what does all of this symbolize? We're used to living in a secular world where science likes to tell us that our planet is dead. And in a world of the five senses where you open up and all you see and think is real is what you see with your five senses. And so it's perfectly okay to exploit that world as much as possible and not to think that you live, move, and have your being within it. And yet when we go into outer space and we see our globe, it's very obvious that we live, move, and have our being within it. We're just tiny little minute cells running around inside of a living being of our planet. And this is said to symbolize that living being that inhabits the life of our planet. And that we as little specks, little cells in our body are supposed to come into tune with so we can help this planet be healthy and peaceful and thriving and not be like little cancer cells running around destroying it. Who are these 24 elders? Well, they're dressed in white with garments. They're dressed in white garments with gold crowns surrounding the Lord of the world. We've already talked about who that is, which is interesting because there's 24 of them. And if we jump to Eastern traditions, that's the sacred number of Shambhala, which is their word for heaven. Shambhala is said to be a place of peace or silence, which brings us back to the idea of Samadhi. There are different levels of Samadhi. Samadhi is basically learning to still the mind in meditation so that it enters deeper and deeper levels of peace. Now that's an oversimplification of it, but that's basically what we're trying to do. Other names for Shambhala in various religious traditions include heaven, Shangri-La, the land of the living spirits, the land of the worthy ones. There's all kinds of names from different religious traditions. If you are willing to be tolerant and open up your mind to researching and understanding different religions and see the similarities to your own, instead of eating of the tree of good and evil and being divisive and separative and only thinking that your limited brain has an understanding instead of all of our brains can come together and give a much greater understanding than just one person's. 
Also, we should note that there are 24 elements that make up the human body. So again, we keep getting in this story, and we're going to get it over and over again, that this is a story about what's going on inside of us and our bodies and how we learn to master and purify that so that when we open our five senses and look out into the world, we do so in a way that is harmonious, peaceful, loving, compassionate, with true vision and understanding. Interestingly enough, for almost all human beings, there's a few anomalies, there are 24 ribs in the average human rib cage that are designed to protect the heart at the center. So we have 12 elders, ribs on one side and 12 on the other side of this throne room. How interesting is that? And more importantly, there are 24 hours in a day. And as previously stated, the goal of yoga is to be able to go into samadhi. And eventually we learn to remain in samadhi or be awake within the throne room so that our brain is aware of spiritual principles and ideals at all times. This is known as having achieved continuity of consciousness or staying within nirvikalpa samadhi, which is one of the highest states or the highest state in some tradition of samadhi. Many different levels of samadhi. This is where we don't have to close our eyes and sit in meditation to become aware of these things. Our eyes are continually open, <laughs> whether we're asleep or awake, and we are always awake and aware. That's how demanding it is to be developed at that level of always being aware of this realm. And most people that are involved in esoteric traditions, we may pop in and out of there <laughs> having different glimpses and insights, but to have continuity of consciousness, to keep the mechanism of this human body always receptive to spiritual principles and ideals, that's true mastery very 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 few people do that and when we see those people we're going to get to that later in, Re in revelation they basically have built what's known as the resurrection body just want to show you this illustration which to me is kind of like somebody lighting up the seven lamps and going up into the throne room there's the om the word of god the alpha and the omega there's that crystal glass floor. Hope you're having fun. I am. So the other thing that we noticed is that there were these four creatures. Well, if we're familiar with esoteric symbolism, which a lot of us are probably watching this video, I'm just bringing it home to you. It's easy to see who these four creatures are. Again, there's the ox, the lion, the eagle, and the man. Well, they're the four creatures on the astrological fixed cross of the zodiac. And it's known in esoteric circles that when a man, now called a disciple or woman, is on the spiritual path, that's somebody who is now actively engaging in the disciplines of spiritual practice, not out there by reading books and having little study groups and, and going to church and singing songs. That's helpful. That's not what this is about. That's not what this book is about. Revelation is about going in here and doing the very hard inner work of discipline, of discipleship, of looking at what's going on within your instrument, your seven lamps that you have to light up and, and cleaning it up, purifying it, cleaning it up. Well, when you're doing that in esoteric circles, it's known that you're on the fixed cross. So here's the symbols of the zodiac signs. And we have the bull, which is Taurus. And we have the lion, which is Leo. The eagle is Scorpio. Now, most people that look at Scorpio are only used to the scorpion, but there are different levels of Scorpio. There's the snake, there's the scorpion, there's the eagle, and some say there's even the phoenix. So the eagle is the spiritually awake side, and the scorpion is the lower side. Now, we're going to go later in Revelation. We're going to see these four beings again reversed here. So, so then we do talk more about the scorpion in Revelation St. John than the eagle. And the man is Aquarius. Only disciples and initiates who have awakened the seven torches and spirits and seen the seven spirits before the throne 
and enter the throne room. Now, disciples tend on the fixed cross tend to pop in and out of there. They go there temporarily in an ecstasy, in a vision, in a revelation, in a samadhi state. But there are those who are initiates who reach it permanently. And how interesting, because they are the ones that are awake 24 elders around the throne, seven, seven days a week, seven lamps, seven torches, seven spirits. Let's look at some of the other elements in this chapter four. So it goes back to the seven burning torches or the lampstand. And when lit, we're told they represent the seven spirits of God, which can be associated with the seven glands that when we stimulate the body in the right way, we activate these glands correctly. And when they're purified in the right way, we have healthy bodies, we have healthy lives, we have healthy impulses. And when they're lit aflame, they bring the seven spirits of God or the chakras into full awakening. Here's another video clip of that process. Now above the throne room, lightning and thunder can be seen and heard. Lightning and thunder can refer to the electrical impulses that are let loose within the brain when the full energy of the chakras enters the brain and sets off a magnetic current as the glands within the cave or throne room in the brain are lit off. The cave is that part within the brain where the pituitary, the pineal, the hypothalamus, these glands sit. And it's like a little empty cavity. We have Christ born in a cave or a manger. There's a hint there in esoteric Christianity as to what we're trying to birth inside ourselves. So we start to have Christ consciousness. We start out as a little baby. And the funny thing about babies is we think we know it all. Babies think they know it all and they're the center of the world. You know, they cry, everybody shows up, everybody does everything for them. You know, it's like the, the angels appear and the ox and lamb bow down. You know, they just think they're really special, those little babies, until they start to learn that they're not. And then they have to grow up and become adults and learn how to have that kind of love and compassion with everybody and not just for their own little selves. Well, here's an illustration I found of basically a brain being electrified. And those people that talk about this experience, if you read the different books, maybe you've had an experience yourself, will talk about the, the heavy charge that seems to literally be going on in the brain. And if we could photograph it, we'd probably see that that's true. And in front of the man is that sea of glass that looks like a crystal, and I showed you that previous video. And that sea of glass reflects how the consciousness associated with the lower chakras is calm because the energy from those lower chakras is drawn up into the throne room where everything becomes crystal clear. So here's our summary for this particular video. St. John is essentially having a mystical experience where he hears the Alpha and the Omega, what some may refer to as God, but you could call it Goddess, Jehovah, Allah, whatever you want to call it. John, St. John, prefers not to give it a name which has any kind of human connotation. And so he also refers to it as the word or the Om. St. John sees a man who radiates like the sun with seven lit lamp, stand, lamp stands, chakras unsealed and lit in front of him. And a sword means he has the power to discern the real from the unreal. And he represents anyone who is able to light the flames of the seven chakras. Of course, the man, not really a man. I mean, this, this picture has the face of a human being, but it could literally just be a sun there. So it could also be what some call our solar logos. Logos means word. St. John refers to word. We have a planetary logos the word, the being that inhabits our planet, the solar logos, the word or being that inhabits our sun. And the man may represent St. John himself, who has lit up his seven chakras, which is why he's able to enter the throne room. And there in the throne room, St. John encounters the Lord of the world. That's who this is, especially down here depicted 
maybe this, but especially down here, who is one of the Kumaras, or in some traditions known as Sanat Kumara, or the Ancient of Days, or Melchizedek, the planetary logos, the word, whose color is green. Now the Lord of the world is also the heart of our planet and is surrounded by ribs, 24 elders, 12 on each side. And St. John has been able to enter this throne room because he was on the path of discipleship, the fixed cross of the bull, Taurus, Lion, Leo, Eagle, Scorpion, Man, Aquarius, Eagle, Scorpio, Man, Aquarius. And through meditation and spiritual disciplines, he had stilled his mind, the crystal glass floor, and been able to enter Samadhi, where he went into the throne room, up into the crown chakra. And from there, he could kind of see what was going on with the different Christian churches. And he decided, or the different chakras of the different disciples trying to follow the spiritual path at that time, could be both. And he basically was told, I'm digressing from the text here for a moment, he was told you know, that he had to do something about their impure state. They weren't pure enough. And the timing was coming, the cycle was coming when something was going to happen. And if they weren't pure enough, they were going to get into trouble. So eventually he and we will be able to remain in that throne room 24-7, 24 hours, seven days a week, as continuity of consciousness is achieved. And in that sense, the hope and goal of all of us is that we will open 144,000 points of the stars or chakra petals so that we will remain 24 seven in the kingdom of God in awareness of the divine presence at all times. But that we're going to expand upon more in part two in our next video. So thank you so much. That's part one. I hope it's been a little bit of a revelation for you. It's going to get way more interesting in the videos to come as I bring this into further conclusion. Thank you so much. And if you enjoy this, please support my work by either subscribing to the channel or becoming a patron. Thank you so much.